Well, this weekend in IES, it's men's weekend. In North America, perhaps, it's Father's Day. But we're the kind of inclusive kind of church. So we are celebrating men's weekend in, in IES. And uh, I want to start with a picture. And this is my picture. And it's going to be shown in the, in the overhead right there pretty soon. And this is a picture of my... Uh, my brother is laughing really hard. He really enjoys uh, this picture. Well, this is taken somewhere in Europe, and I can't really remember whether it's in Germany or somewhere else in Europe. And I remember now, this is really embarrassing, because I was thinking at that moment that I would look like a European somehow with a jacket and with the beret, you know, it's like I'm pretending to be European. But what's really special in this picture is looking at the face of my dad that he has that approving smile to me. And I kept that in my, in, on my desk. Um, at, in, in, in celebrating Men's Weekend, I, I thought it would be really cool to, to get some of the stories from men in IES and how their dads are to them and, and remembering their dads in this uh, Men's Weekend. So let's just play that video, please. What's your dad known for? He's a very loving and caring dad. Gentle, warm, but yet is very firm on like teaching the kids. He's fun. He's fun. My dad is known as the peacemaker. He's the one that always wants everybody to live peacefully. My dad is known for uh, his integrity, strong in, in, uh, in spirit. My dad is known for being a person that just works really hard and also a person who's been very generous. And Dad also was the one that had all the tools that everybody needed to do all the different jobs. What are the best experiences or memories you have with your, with your dad? He taught me how to drive. He taught me life values, um, practical theories that I can put uh, as I'm growing up. My mother and father both loved horses and we used to go time, spend time at the race, uh, race course together. So that was probably the, uh, the best experience I had uh, as a kid. We actually spent a lot of time as a father and son actually watching a bunch of movie together. I remember when I was about seven years old, I broke my arm and the suggestion was they need to amputate. And I know my dad said, no way. And eventually, there was another way, and that's why I have my arms complete today. <laughs> what are the best lessons your dad ever taught you? Don't be only smart at school, but become, well, now you can call it street smart. It's just to be a man of God myself and to, to love God and to put Him first in my life. You never get to give up whatever you're facing. Integrity. You need to mean what you say, you have to stick what you say. I've learned a lot of things from watching him, from his behavior, you know. And one of the greatest things I've learned from my dad is put people first, I mean, put other people's needs before yours. And remember that uh, when people do something bad to you, it's not necessarily just they doing it. They might be other factors influencing them to behave that way to you. So. When are you most like your dad? When? I guess all the time. <laughs> I'm kind of the spitting image of my dad in many ways. Uh, we're, we're very, very similar physically. Uh, we have a lot of the same mannerisms. And yeah, that's probably what I'm most like my dad in. Probably this is not a good thing. When I'm angry, I used to snap. It's kind of like my dad when I was a kid. I used to uh, see him snap over uh, simple things. Dads are special. Dads are our heroes. And for our, our, us guys, they are the ones who gives us the example how to fix things. If something happens with the car, you ask dad what to do with the car. God, dads are the logical ones. I'm sorry, mom, but dads are just the logical ones when we need to confide with them. And dads are the ones who gives us examples and bail us out when we are in trouble and provide for us when we don't have cash. So dads are always there. And they are, they are the ones who provided for us. Um, if you ask me, uh, what is my dad known for? And I asked my oldest brother. And then he said, oh, you know, dad is generous. And it is true. My dad is a very generous and kind-hearted man. And um, 
he, you know, he helps everybody that knocks on his door, just anybody. And I must say, I am not like my dad, but I can tell you that my brother is like my dad. So you can knock on his door if you need help. <laughs> Thank you, Adia. <laughs> um, in the Bible, Jesus has a dad, and we know his name. We know what he does for a living. But as the story of Jesus progresses, Joseph seems to disappear from the story. And this is what Jesus is bringing us to you and I today. That there is a dad in heaven. And he begins his story by teaching his disciples. And he taught them this particular prayer. This is then is how you should pray, our Father in heaven. Now think about it uh, for a second. It, we, we are so used to this, and a lot of us have learned to memorize this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, and so forth. In Jesus' days, for the disciples, it was a completely radical idea that in the Old Testament, God the Father, or referred as a father, was only mentioned seven times. And, um, and so they, they all know God the defender, God the protector, God who, wants to, who is the, the one delivered them uh, from, from the Egyptians. So all these things, God Almighty, these are the, the thing that, that all the Israelites and the Jews of that day think about God. And Jesus came. And the first thing he taught them was our Father, not Yahweh, not God Almighty. And Jesus is saying to you and I today that God is a personal God and he wants to be known as a personal God. He wants to be your Father, my Father, our Father. Now, um, I know for, for some people... Their dads are not ideal. Their dads are, 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 are hard. And, and so when, when this idea of God the Father is introduced to them, they say, if God is anything like my dad, no thanks. I don't want any of it. So I want to bring to you back to the Bible and think and, and discover once again how the Bible reveals to us about this perfect father. And, and perhaps we don't have that perfect father picture that we wish we once had. But there is a father in heaven that is more than perfect. And let us open our hearts and let us pray. Father, I pray this morning that you will just speak to us and speak through the scripture and speak in a very personal way to the, everyone that sits in this place. Lord, you know how their relationship with their dads or with their moms. And Lord, I pray through your words that, that these relationships will be renewed this morning. We just ask that you will speak to us and Holy Spirit reveal to us the secrets of the kingdom so that we may live the way you want us to be and we may have the joy Joy from knowing you as our Heavenly Father. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The first thing the Bible taught us about God the Father is this. That God the Father chose us. God the Father chose us. And let's read from 1 Peter 1 verse 2. It says, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. Suppose that. The, king, uh, the Queen of England, now that's, England is the only monarchy that I kind of know that kind of familiar or kind of thriving still. And so suppose the king, Queen of England come to me and say, hey, uh, Misha, why, I, I want you to be a prince, not to be a baron, not an earl, but I want you to be a prince in my kingdom. You get to rule with me. I don't care if you're kind of dark skin. I don't care if you're blue blood or not blue eyes, brown eyes, and I don't care if you have the right accent. I want you to be an heir in my kingdom. Our Father, He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when He gives His invitation, it's greater than any kingdom in this earth. 
And not only we get to be a part of his kingdom, but we get to rule with him. That's what the Bible promises. And the, 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 the magnificent thing in here is that he chose us long time ago. God the Father chose us long time ago. God the P Father chose you and me. A lot of us face some kind of rejection, but the most difficult rejection we face is the rejection we face at home. And maybe our dads are difficult with us. And, and maybe our dads continually putting us down and think whatever ideas we come up with is never a good idea. And, 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 and maybe they say things that are so mean that just breaks us apart. And maybe someday our dads are not just heavy with words, but heavy with their hands and get physical and just makes it hard to be at home. The antidote to any rejection is adoption. The antidote of any rejection is God's adoption. It says there, God the Father chose you. He's the one who actively choosing you. And he wants you to be a part of his kingdom and part of his family. You, you know what was incredible about this? God never reevaluate this promise. He said it a long time ago, and he never waited when you come out to the world. He never says, well, let's see first if this baby comes out right. Wait, he's going to be bald someday. Maybe I'm not going to have him. Or, oh, look at this girl. Something wrong with her nose. Pesek, maybe. You know, you know I'm not going to choose this girl. God never reevaluate his promise. Once he said it, Thousands of years ago, he kept at it. He chose you. He knew you before you know yourself. God chose you. I really like what Pastor Dave shared last week. He talked about um, blessings and curses. And it's a really good sermon. I hope you get to, to, if you haven't got a chance to listen to the sermon, go back to our, our YouTube channel or go to our website. And it's already up there since Monday. And it talks about blessings and curses. Those who are blessed are the ones who have a relationship with God. And it talks about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They are blessed because they have a relationship with God. And one day, Adam and Eve chose to not live according to what God had said, the kind of rules that he had set in that garden. They chose to break that relationship. So they move away from that life of blessing to a life of curse because, not because the, the God the Father didn't want them, but because they chose, they chose to break the rules. Now this promise that we read today Reveal to us that God always intended to have that relationship even with us today. So he chose, he made this decision to choose before we choose to follow him, before we choose to know about what Jesus and the Bible is, before we even make a first attempt to discover about the truth. God already chose us in spite of us. And this is the beauty of God. He never, ever wanted to have a severed relationship. He always wants to have a relationship with all of us. God the Father chose you a long time ago and knew that you would become his children. If you grew up in a different faith than Christian, and, and this idea of adoption may be a really foreign idea. In, in other faiths, people come and in search for God, and they worship because they're going to try, oh, maybe if I do good, maybe if I do the, the, the moral thing, if I, if I do the ethical thing, and maybe I can win the favor of God. Maybe if I give enough offering, then God will be appeased by the offering. And, and, and hopefully by doing all this worship, God will, you know, either protect me or give me, you know, whatever provision that I need. And and it's always a, a, a mankind attempting to appease or to gain favor from God. The wonderful message of the gospel is that God chose you first. It's not about our attempts to win the favor of God. It's God chose us first before we even know what's going on or understand what is right or wrong. God chose us. Us. And that is our God 
the Father. And then he continues in Psalm. This is what he gives to you and I. A father to the fatherless, a defender of the widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. You may feel today that you don't have a father. Or maybe you have a father, but it doesn't feel like he's there. And God's promise to you and I today, I am the father to the fatherless. And this message is true today for you. If you're longing for that father you never had, God is giving you this promise. I am the father to the fatherless. Now you might ask, so, okay, you know, where, where are you now, God? Where are you when I need you? Where are you, my father, when I need you? Because I really need you today. When the disciples, um, uh, well, most of the disciples, they are, they're fishermen. So one day they went on a boat, and Jesus was traveling with them. And um, so they went on a boat, and then suddenly the, the weather kind of changed. And, of course, as the fishermen, they're used to, the, to the, the, the rough weather. So it's okay, but this particular day, the weather got rougher and rougher, and they kind of got scared. And so they wake Jesus up and they say, Master, teacher, don't you care? And sometimes we are sort of in that position when there is a storm in our life. And although Jesus is in the same boat with us, we feel like he is not there, that he's not doing anything about our situation. So we ask, Jesus, do you care? And this is what the Bible is revealing to us today, that God, the Father... God the Father cares for us. God the Father cares for us. And this is what he's promised to you in 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. He cares about you. And you and I ask that question of God all the time in a thousand thousand ways. God, did you see what my dad did to me? Don't you even care? Do you see how he hurt me and made a mess out of my life? Do you see how my dad ignores me? God, don't you care? Do you know how I struggle through my adulthood because all the things that happened in my childhood? God, don't you care? Psalm 147. He heals the brokenhearted. And binds up their wounds. And you may be today, you ask that question. You, you are hurting. You have so much pain from growing up. And you could never ever pass that pain. He heals the brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Yes, God, the Father, cares for you. In the past, you did not know who he was. In the past, you did not know that you have a dad uh, in heaven. You did not know how to call on him. But today, he is revealing himself to you through the scripture that he is committed to binding up your wounds and heal your brokenhearted. Your Father in heaven cares for you. And whether it is a relationship issue that you need help or a physical issue, a day-to-day issue, God the Father cares for you. Matthew 7 says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts? Gifts. How much more he knows how to give good gifts to you. Do you know what worry is? Worry is not believing that God can help you. Worrying is not believing that God has all that it takes and all the resources in heaven to provide for you. God even... even um, even cares for the things that we don't think about that we think that we need. Nobody prays like, oh, Lord, please fill up the atmosphere with oxygen or make sure that the earth rotates, you know, continually so 
gravitational pull will not ever release us to the space. We don't think about that that much. And yet God, the Father, provide for us. He knows how to give good gifts. And then Psalm 103 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. As a father who has compassion, he cares for you compassionately. He deeply cares for you. And the third thing the Bible reveals to us is that God the Father is a consistent father to us. He is consistent with us. James 1 verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He is not, he does not change like shifting shadows. God is unchanging. God is consistent Father. Human fathers often can be unpredictable. And I know some people, when they go home and to their, their parents, they, they don't really know how what to expect of their dad, hoping, well, maybe he's in a good mood today, or maybe he's going to be upset for whatever reason that he's upset about, or maybe he's going to be in a talking mood today, or maybe he's just going to be completely silent and shut me off today. Human fathers sometimes are inconsistent, but God, he said, he does not change like shifting shadows. God is never moody. Your heavenly father is consistent. One thing you can always count on is that he always acts the same towards you. And even if we're doing things that are wrong, if we sin and we thought, well, he's going to be mad at me, you know, he never changed in the way he responds to us. In the Bible it says in 2 Timothy 2, if we are faithless, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Our father remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. And we know this world keeps changing. And sometimes we try to keep up with everything that goes in the world and we lose grip and we don't know where we're going. We we know we cannot stay behind because everybody is like moving forward. and, and, And so we find ourselves in a place where I don't really have a place to stand. Things are changing so much. Where do I go? What should I do? How can I survive? And then the word of God through Isaiah 54 says, For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then, my faithful love for you will remain. My faithful love for you will remain. The gospel has shown us that he is the father that chose us, that God the father is the one who cares for us, and he is the father that is consistent with us. And the next question is, how, what do we do with this? What do we do with the gospel, with the truth, with the good news that we have heard? And perhaps this morning, some of you need to take that in your heart and say, God, today is the day I want to, I want to accept your love. Maybe some of you really is so broken apart. And maybe this is the day. Father, I know you are up there somewhere. I want you to be my father in my life. And for some of you, you've been a Christian for a long time. And, and so I, I want uh, to, to do some a further application uh, to, to what I have shared uh, to you this morning. Um, and, and I want to share to you my, my personal testimony uh, on, on this one. So, a few years ago, uh, I, 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 I had a dream, and um, I was sort of between waking up in the morning, but not really awake yet. You know that state, right? So, and I suddenly have a dream, and then in this dream, I was playing on the field. Out, I was imagining myself being a 10-year-old kid. And I was running around, and, and, and then so I find myself you know, lying on the, on the grass, looking in the sky, looking at the sun, and beautiful. 
And then um, in, in my mind, I goes, you know, I, I, uh, I sort of want to, ha- I want to see my, my, uh, my dad's approving smile. And, and so in that dream, I perhaps it's a longing for, from my heart to it's kind of missing my dad. And, and at that moment, I start to wake up. And, uh, I, I, and then my, 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 my logic starts to kick in. And, and then I told myself, wait, you are not 10 years old anymore. Why are you still waiting for uh, an approving smile from your dad? You are old enough to be giving an approval smile instead of expecting it. And the next thing that comes to my mind, wait, you need to grow up. You need to grow up. And so, you know, with any kind of dream, I, I thought, you know, I better check the Bible. So I went to the Bible, and, and I like this version for Matthew 5, verse 48. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. So this is Jesus telling his disciples. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. That's right. I needed to grow up. I needed to grow up. And what's really interesting in this, in this paragraph where, where this uh, particular verse is taken, this is the paragraph when Jesus taught his disciples, love your enemy. Love your enemy. And that taught me one thing. You know, I, I, I know that, that God has given me his love. Now it's time for me to grow up and share that love and live it out through, uh, to live that love and to share that love. And, and the, I'm going to share to you three things that, from my message this morning and how to, to apply this love that God has so generously given to us. And this is the first thought. We can choose to love like our Heavenly Father choose us. We can choose. You know, love is not just a feeling. It's not when we feel good, then we love. If you feel offended, then there's no love. Love is an action and love is a decision. We can decide to love. And we can decide to love just as much as we are loved by our Heavenly Father. That scripture says we are kingdom subjects and we need to act like one. Secondly, we can apply this, uh, this message this morning. We can care like heaven, our Heavenly Father cared for us. Now, how can you apply this in your relationship with your dad? Or any of your parents that might break your heart. You can start, if, if your relationship is strained, the first thing you can try before making, you know, reopening that or remedying that conversation is start praying for them. That's how you can show care. Just like your heavenly father care for you, you can grow up and say, I want to be the adult in my relationship with my parents, and I want to start praying for my parents. And you can start as simply as praying for their health. As people age, health will be the, the, the number one worry, and that's the first subject you can pray for. And you can pray for other things about their lives. But you can start remedying and, and start showing care to your parents, your dad, by praying. And then if you haven't talked to him uh, for a long time, you can st- you know, start picking up the phone call and say hi and, and just leave it at that. And I know it's going to be awkward. And the thing is, there is nothing wrong with awkward. When you want to start that conversation, it's going to be awkward. But expect it. Yeah, the thing about awkward, that only means that you have made the right step to restoring the relationship. When it's awkward, you are actually living out what God had wanted you to do, to show that you care and to share that love. Now, my family, we're not like, you know, we don't, especially when we grow up, we don't say like, I love you, I love you. And especially in Indonesian, it's kind of weird. You don't say, saya cinta kamu. I mean, it's just kind of weird. Saya mengasihimu, ibu. I mean, that would be really strange. In English, it's kind of, kind of easier to say. And, and so I decided uh, whatever the reaction I have from my mom, that, that, that I decided, you know, I'm just going to say I love you. 
it could be awkward, it could be weird, but, but I just say it because I know God and his love compels me to say I love you because he loves me first. He chose me. I know I can apply and give and share that love. God's love, the, the love that God gives me is it's so abundant, so much, and there is much that I can give. Um, and then the third thing we can apply is that we can be consistent like our Heavenly Father is consistent with us. We can be consistent to our dad in our relationship like our Heavenly Father is consistent with us. We can try visiting every week or we can, you know, pick up a call so, and, and, and give, give a call in a regular basis. And that, that is something that you can do that you can do in restoring this relationship that may be strained and, and maybe it hurts so much to open up that door and, and, and reestablish that connection. But God the Father is consistent with you. And he never lets you down. He's always there for you. And it is our, our time as kingdom people to live like our Father in heaven, and be consistent. Now, a few years ago, I decided, oh, you know, maybe I should, I should visit my, at this time, because all this revelation happened when, when my dad already passed, so I can only apply it to my mom. So I thought, oh, maybe I can visit her on a regular basis every Sunday evening. And I just do it that way, and I don't broadcast it. I don't make everybody come with me. But as time progresses, both my brothers uh, and, and their families, they start joining. And now we really enjoy coming together, meeting together every Sunday night, just being there. It is the love of God at work in our family. And it is the love of the Father being real. And I can attest to you today, that love for you is real. And not only real to me, but it also real to you, and it can heal whatever broken relationship you have. 